Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for Inclusive Dialogue, Empathy in Times of Chaos. We're excited to have you here with us tonight. My name is Krista Regenetter, and I am the Program Officer, Global Education at the Stanley Center for Peace and Security. This evening's event is brought to you by four partners, the Stanley Center for Peace and Security's Global Education Program, Muscatine Community College, the Community Foundation of Greater Muscatine, and the Musser Public Library. And we just want to give a shout out to all of our partners for helping us make this event happen. We're very excited to be here with you tonight. The Global Education Program at the Stanley Center fosters inclusive dialogue and celebrates diverse perspectives to build a more equitable and just society. Our emphasis is on partnering with the Muscatine community, mostly community educators and organizations, to grow global awareness and understanding. We believe that to build a more just and equitable society, we need to be aware of the challenges that our people are facing around the world and here in Muscatine. And that's one of the reasons that we're here tonight. Beyond our hometown, the Stanley Center partners with people, organizations, and the greater global community to drive policy progress on three key areas, mitigating climate change, avoiding the use of nuclear weapons, and preventing mass violence and atrocities. If you're interested in learning more about the Stanley Center, I encourage you to visit our website at stanleycenter.org. So we're just gonna take a few minutes to review our agenda tonight before we get started. After this introduction and welcome, you're going to hear from Imbolo Mbue. She's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Behold the Dreamers, a book which won the Penn Faulkner Award and was selected for Oprah's Book Club. And we did ask Imbolo and she has been to Oprah's house. Um, Mbolo is a native of Limbe, Cameroon. She's a graduate from Rutgers and Columbia Universities, and she's going to be talking about immigration and the American dream. She's also going to talk about how her work and her experiences, what they can teach us about empathy in our relationships with others. After Mbolo's opening remarks, you will hear from Naomi DeWinter, the president of Muscatine Community College, and Daniel Salazar, the Student Senate President at Mustang Community College, and they're gonna have a conversation with Mbolo about Behold the Dreamers. Following their dialogue is the opportunity to get questions from the audience. So what you need to do is look on your screen and find the chat function, click on chat, and it will ask you to enter your name and also to agree to some terms. Once you do that, you'll be able to post questions there. You won't see the questions pop up immediately, but they will be, they will be posted and what we're gonna be doing is looking through those questions and summarizing some and synthesizing them and presenting them for Naomi and Daniel to have that Q&A section with Mbolo. So please be posting those questions as soon as you have them so we're ready for that section of our time together. And you can also, if you see a question that you really like that somebody else has posted, there is a way to like that and that will kind of flag for us that there's some questions that multiple people are really interested in. So we encourage you to use that feature too. Once the Q&A is finished, then you are gonna hear from Sharla Schaefer and Vivian Jardine with the Community Foundation of Greater Muscatine. And they're going to introduce some ways that you can stay engaged with diversity, equity, and inclusion in Muscatine. We have some exciting information to share with you at that point. The goal for tonight's event is to promote meaningful dialogue that offers us the opportunity to expand our awareness of other perspectives and to build empathy. In celebration of Muscatine's immigrant and refugee communities, we felt Behold the Dreamers would provide the opportunity to explore one immigrant story and think about how the characters might relate to themes in our own community here in Muscatine and wherever you are. Mbolo's book is informed by her experiences as an African immigrant and also the stories that immigrants from all over the world have shared with her. We hope the event will lead to conversations past tonight's virtual dialogue allowing us to explore those themes and continue conversations. The discussion guide was sent to you in the confirmation email that you received when you registered for the event, but we'll be sending you another email next week with also a survey for some feedback. And we'd really appreciate it if you would take the time to fill out that survey and let us know how, um, what you think about tonight's event. 
So we have over 120 people joining us tonight. What's exciting is that we have people from Muscatine and the Iowa community, but we also have people from all over the US. My friend Araceli is joining us from California with her gorgeous baby. Our friend Christy in Bend, Oregon is here and she's one of the people that helped us plan this event. We have book club members from all over. And a shout out to my book club and my friends here participating tonight. We have Eastern Iowa Community College students joining us. So we just wanna give a big welcome to everybody and thank you very much for taking your Friday night to join us. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Mbolo Mbue and thank you Mbolo for joining us tonight. I'm very excited to hear what you have to share. Thank you so much, Krista. Thank you everybody for, for having me. I, um, I have um, spoken around the country quite a bit, but I've never spoken in Iowa. So this is my first time speaking in a great state of Iowa. We're sort of not really quite there, but this is um, as close as I've come to speaking in Iowa. Um, so thank you everybody. Thank you to the, to, to the Stanley Center and to the Community Foundation and to the Muscatine College and also to, um, to the library. It means a lot to me. Um, so my name is Mbolombwe, which I've been told is not an easy name to pronounce, but it is pronounced Mbolombwe. And I am, like Krista said, I am the author of the novel Behold the Dreamers, um, which came out four years ago. Um, it is a novel about what happened um, uh, um, to two families in New York City during the financial crisis of 2008-2009. Um, the families are, are, are very different. One is an upper class wealthy white family. The other family is a working class immigrant family from my native Cameroon. Um, and like Krista mentioned, I um, even though this novel is not autobiographical, I do have quite a bit in common with the, um, with the characters from Cameroon. Um, I, I, came, I came to America um, in 1998, so I've spent most of my life here at this point. I came here um, to go to college um, and I ended up moving to New York City at some point and, and um, living in Harlem like the characters in my novel. Um, but before all that, I lived in, in a town called Limbe, which is the town in which the characters and um, the immigrant characters are from. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about um, my early life before coming here and, and how my journey from Cameroon to New York City, how that um, influenced the writing of this novel. So I spent most of my life in a seaside town called Limbe, which is my hometown. I love Limbe a lot and I still do. On school days, I walked with my friends for about an hour to attend a public secondary school. For high school, I attended an all girls boarding school. Upon graduation from high school, thanks to the generosity of relatives I had abroad, I came to America to go to college. I arrived here in September of 1998. My first impression of America was that everything was big, a lot bigger than I'd ever seen in my life. The buildings were bigger, the roads were bigger, the people were bigger. In those days, I weighed about 90 pounds on a good day, so I felt even smaller when than I already was. Looking around me, I probably wondered what I needed to do to get big enough to survive in the country. Thankfully, within hours of my arrival, the relative I was traveling with suggested that we go to a famous American restaurant and have something called a burger. I had heard of this thing called a burger, but I'd never tasted one. So I was very excited on the drive to the restaurant. But then we get to this restaurant, which I found that was called McDonald's, and I learned that there isn't just one kind of burger. There were about 20 different kinds of burgers. Even the menu at McDonald's was big with a lot of options. I learned my first lesson about this country right away, that Americans don't like to have one kind of anything. They love variety. Variety wasn't something that abounded in my hometown of Limbe in the 90s. If you wanted to buy, milk, you bought the same brand of powdered milk as everyone else. If you wanted to watch television, the whole country watched one channel. Nowadays, there are more, there are more selections in my country thanks to the Americanization of everything. But in the late 90s, Cameroon and America still existed on very different realms. So on that first day in America, standing in McDonald's, 
I realized that I needed to decide between a Big Mac and a double cheeseburger and a quarter pounder. And I believe there was a double quarter pounder with cheese also. So not being accustomed to a plethora of choices, I couldn't decide. So I said, you know, forget about this many burgers. I'm going, I'm not getting a burger anymore. I scanned the menu and I saw something called chicken nuggets and I got a bit confused. I didn't know chickens had a thing called nuggets. I told myself, you know what? It doesn't matter. I'm going to try it. So I did. And I love these chicken nuggets. And for many years, McDonald's chicken nuggets had a special place in my heart because it was my welcome to America moment. After having my chicken nuggets, I, I took a plane that evening to continue to Chicago to live with relatives for a few months before returning to New Jersey to go to college. I went to Rutgers. It was during my stay in Chicago that my homesickness began, a deep unremitted longing. I wanted nothing more than to go back to Limbe, to see my mother, to be with my friends, to walk around the open air market in my hometown, to stroll up and down streets filled with familiar faces. I'd like to say it was the Chicago weather that made me so homesick, that living in a warm seaside town for a cold city would make anyone want to flee. But it was more than the weather. It was many other things, including the reality of America, which was so unlike the America of my imagination. The America I encountered in those first days in, in, um, here was nothing like what I'd seen on television in Cameroon. The people I met did not live like the characters on the Cosby show or drive cars like the folks on Beverly Hills 90210. They didn't have the kind of world on, like I saw on soap operas like Dallas and Dynasty, which was, those shows were very big shows in Cameroon when I was growing up. I had imagined before arriving here that somehow I would seamlessly slide into such a life. America would be like Cameroon to me. It would be like my home, but I have a, I have a lot more money, of course, because isn't that the promise of America? Instead, I had to deal with the fact that many immigrants I met seemed defeated tired and cynical. The broader country did not appear to be much better. My friends and I laugh when we talk about this. Why didn't we hear about this other America before coming here, we ask ourselves. We blame the media. We say they sold us a sanitized version of America. Whatever, whatever happened to honesty? In blaming the media though, we forget that Cameroonian TV viewers, like TV viewers the world over, are humans. And that as humans, we prefer beautiful stories with endings that come with bows nicely tied at the top. The American media simply gave us what we were looking for. And why wouldn't they? Do we really want to hear about Americans left bankrupt by medical bills or innocent men stopped in solitary confinement? Do we want to watch TV shows about children going to sleep hungry in the wealthiest country on earth? Did we want to listen to testimonies of industrious men and women who worked from sunrise to sun yes, sunset and yet remained in debt? No, Cameroon had enough of his own troubles. We needed to believe there was something better for us out there. The glorious America gave us hope. Only when I arrived here did I hear that there was something called racism. Only then did I learn of the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King Jr. Funny though, I, I knew a great deal about Woodrow Wilson and the League of Nations, but I'd never heard of the plight of Native Americans. Only after I arrived here did I hear people being described as homeless, a phenomenon which was all but non-existent in my hometown. Interestingly, in those first few months in the country, a friend of mine wrote me from Cameroon and said, oh, Imbolo, I'm so sorry. I heard you arrived safely in America, that you, but you're very homeless. I was very confused. And then I realized that what my friend meant to say was that she had heard that I was very homesick. And I thought in a way, well, she's right because I felt very homeless. I'd given up my home for a new home in a new country that I may never find. That sense of a lost home would follow me for many years and greatly influence my, my novel, Behold the Dreamers. Thank you.
Mbolo, thank you so much for agreeing to spend some time with our audience here in, in Muscatine, Iowa. I am Naomi D. Winter, and I'm the president of Muscatine Community College. So I'm the first person after Krista to welcome you to beautiful Muscatine, Iowa. I can look over my left shoulder and see the wonderful mighty Mississippi River that runs through our town. Uh, it's a very, very beautiful place, and we look forward to a time when we can welcome you here in person. Uh, I also want to uh, say hello to my three daughters who are watching tonight. And I had to laugh when you spoke about the chicken nuggets. <laughs> Just before I left to come here tonight, I, I gave them the direction to warm up some chicken nuggets. <laughs> in our freezer. So we have something in, in common. Um, so Danielle and I would like to uh, ask you some questions uh, after reading the book that we very much enjoy. And I will start with the first question. Of course, the title of your book is Behold the Dreamers. And we would like to ask you to discuss the role of dreams in your mm -hmm. novel. How do dreams drive the plot of the novel? And what kind of dreams do these characters wish to achieve? What dreams are deferred? Mm. Well, um, I should start off by saying that for somebody who wrote a novel called Behold the Dreamers, I am not a very big dreamer. Um, I didn't grow up in a very dream culture. And that is the one thing about America that I noticed that this was a culture that was very big on dreaming. Um, children here from a very, very early age, you know, believe in yourself, go after your dreams, your dreams will come true. and and. And, and the, the, the dream in the novel, um, in the title, refers to the American dream. And the dreamers refers to people like myself who came here believing in the American dream. And, and the American dream is very much at the center of this novel. Um, because like I said earlier, this is a novel about two families, one wealthy family, which on the surface, it looks like they have achieved the American dream. The father works on Wall Street, um, they have a, a nice house in, on Park Avenue, a nice apartment on Park Avenue in the city. They have a, a summer house in the Hamptons, which is just um, typical of the one percenters in New York City. And, and the other family, the, the father of the family is a chauffeur for the wealthy family. And they, uh, they, they, they have not achieved the American dream. They came here believing that this dream is gonna be uh, accessible to them. And so this, um, I think the Behold the Dreamer applies to both families, right? It applies to, to those who have achieved the dream and, and the sacrifices that they have to make to hold on to this dream. And it also applies to those who are chasing that dream and, and, and what that chase costs them. Because of, for those who have read the novel, you'll see that um, in their attempt to achieve this American dream, the family makes a lot of sacrifices and, and, and they pay dearly, right? Because the American dream is very costly. And so, um, they pay a lot, but without giving away the plot, um, there they, they are dreams that don't come true, right? <laughs> that is the one thing that we don't talk about enough that, you know, as much as we like to tell our children to have dreams and believe in their dreams, some dreams don't come true. I mean, I am an example of that. I am, I am in a way sitting here as a, as a novelist because other dreams that I had did not come true. I had many dreams that I, I pursued and it didn't quite work out for me. And, and, and as, as life would have it, writing worked out for me. But um, I, this is a novel that is very much about failures also. It is about dreams that came true, the cost of dreams uh, and, and, the, the, and, and the dreams that um, you pursue forever and you give so much into it and it just does not come true. Well, thank you again for being here. It's fantastic to have you here with us. Um, I'm Daniel again, by the way. I'm the student senate president. So in your novel, uh, we see a lot of uh, immigration. And immigration plays a huge role for the jungle. America is a place of hope and promise and a place where you can become somebody. Mm -hmm. But the machine and the politics are anything but welcoming. And they and clear the road for citizenship is dangerous. Can you discuss the portrayal of the American immigration in this novel and how does this shift the traditional representation of America? Mm. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Daniel. I, um, 
I, I think that the one thing that nobody um, told me about, which is part of what this novel is about, is about the, this idea, you know, a lot of us had before coming here about the reality of America, how we were so naive um, about what it would take to succeed in this country. Um, the one thing nobody really advised us on, at least not didn't advise me, was how difficult it is, um, the immigration process. I mean, I am a citizen now, but I know that it is a very, very difficult and complicated process to become, to become a citizen in this country. And I am very amazed whenever I talk to audiences and how suppressed people are, um, because the characters in, in the novel, the African immigrants, um, they don't exactly have papers. So part of, the, part of this novel deals with living with them, um, not fully documented status because at, at one point one of the characters is facing deportation uh, and and it amazes me how people um do not understand how somebody will end up facing deportation and they say things like oh why doesn't he just get a green card but it, it, it is not that easy <laughs> you don't just get a green card because if we could we wouldn't have 11, 11 million on, on, you know undocumented immigrants Right. The, the reason why um, we have such a situation is because it is a very, very complex process to, to, um, to move from a newly arrived person, um, outside of those who came here with family connections or with job status, but to move from that position to becoming um, a, a green card holder or a citizen is very, very complicated. And so um, that is the other thing that I, I wanted to write about, about, you know, write honestly about how tedious and, and and, and painful and disheartening it is um, to try to become um, a citizen in this country. And, and again, it is a very, very expensive process. And for people like the characters in my novel, they don't exactly have the kind of money that you could use to fight the long legal battle to get to have citizenship. So it was important to me that I was honest about that, not only about the challenges of of their working class status, but also the challenges of moving from being undocumented um, um, immigrants to becoming citizens. Well, we have a, an organization in Muscatine called the Diversity Services Center of Iowa and who uh, represents uh, the people you were talking about with those difficult processes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's, a, it's a point of pride uh, mm -hmm. for our city to, to have that service. Um, to our many uh, immigrants and, and refugees in our area. Yeah, and I should say that I was just I was just reading a book. I'm reading a book right now. Uh, it's by a famous chef, chef named David Chang, and he mentions one of his mentors is is um, Dr. John uh, John Kim, I think, uh, and he is from Muscatine. That's, I'm just trying to say that one of his mentors from Muscatine, and he is from um, I believe he was he came from. Um, um, South Korea, and he moved to um, Muscatine, Iowa, and he ended up becoming um, president of Dartmouth College and also the head of the World Bank. And I said, oh, go Muscatine. So that is just a point of saying that this, you know, it made me feel good about this town where this um, immigrant family moved to and, and this, um, the, 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 the young man ended up becoming a great American citizen. Yes, yes, yeah, we are proud of that history. Um, and we've actually uh, invited him to speak to our community um, oh, good. in the next year. So yes, yes. Uh, it's funny that we're making all these uh, connections. With yeah, them. yeah. I was just reading it this week and I said, yeah, Muscatine. So uh, yeah, but that is a great example. Thank you, Naomi. Yes, very good. So we're, we're speaking to you after uh, the, the United States presidential election has, has mm. taken place. And uh, we want to ask you to address this momentous occasion of having Kamala Harris, the daughter of immigrants, the first woman, the first black person, the first Indian American, and the first Asian American to be elected to the office of vice president of the United States. Mm. Well, I, I, it reminds me of the great quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. about um, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Um, because I do think that, you know, this is where the world is going. Um, Kamala Harris is just the beginning, right? Before we know it, we'll have a Mexican-American president, we'll have a gay American president, we'll have a legally blind American president. Um, and, and it could be from either party. This is not a, 
this is not a, 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 a democratic win or a Republican win. I think that this is just where the world is going. The world is going towards a place where we are going to start being more aware um, with judging people by the content of their character. <laughs> um, and, and for me, as somebody who really believes in, um, in treating everybody equally, I, it, it was a great moment of celebration that, that Kanamala Harris was judged you know, by, by, on her own merit, not because she was a person of color or anything, but because she was um, the right candidate and the people decided that she, she's, she's, she's deserving of that position. I've read some recent articles that uh, describe young, young girls mm -hmm. uh, seeing uh, Kamala Harris winning and mm -hmm. you know, beginning to dream themselves of, of how uh, the doors may be opening for their future leadership. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is a great moment for us women and for people who support women. You know, they, um, not just for for women themselves, but I, I think that um, again, it is the the thing that heartens me is that many people worked for us to get to this moment. And Kamala Harris said that herself: men and women um, gave their lives and sacrificed for us to get to a moment where um, a woman can be vice president of America, a woman of color, and, and I. I think it's incumbent on all of us to continue moving, moving the world in that direction. You, know, you don't want to be on the wrong side of history and stand against progress. Um, you want to be uh, on the side of history that's pushing for, 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 for this to continue happening, for whether it is a white man or, or, a, or a, a gay woman, that everybody should have equal chance. And, and it is our duty, all of us, to keep on making sure that we um, open the doors for everybody to have this equal chance. Even sometimes, you know, supporting progress and supporting the right thing isn't always easy. No. At, at the time, it can seem as though it's the wrong thing to do because not, not everyone else is doing it. That's true. Very true. So on that, and, you know, having people seeing uh, our president elect and vice president, that's historic. Yes. You, yes. you seem to talk a lot about the importance of stories. So, could you elaborate more on the importance of stories and, and how we can collect those stories, how we can share it and just have that conversation? Right. Yeah, well, I, I think that that is something which I learned a lot over the past four years, um, especially because, you know, my novel came out in 2016, which was a very not easy year for immigrants, right? <laughs> that was a year when immigration was very much in the news and a lot of it was, was negative and, you know, immigrants were being called certain names. And, and, and there was the, 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 the rhetoric around immigrants and immigration was quite negative. And then I, I started going out to talk about my book and I, and I went to all these places around the country talking about it. And the one thing that people said to me, which really touched me was that here, reading your book and thinking about, you know, seeing these characters up close, hearing their story changes my perception of, of immigrants and, and, and the way I feel about them and the way I feel about you know, people that I don't really know much about, which made me realize that it, the difference, the biggest thing is to tell our stories, is to tell each other our stories and to say, this is me, this is what happened to me, this is where I, how I came here, this is why I am the way I am. Because people, would, um, people wouldn't think about the life of an African immigrant chauffeur and think, well, this is, this is, these are his challenges at home. They would make assumptions, right? Because as humans, we, we like to make assumptions. But I, I, I learned that, that it is very important to be honest with each other about our true selves. And that doesn't mean that you have to go ahead and start posting your whole life on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, because I, I am a, a very private person. You won't find me on social media. But it is still important to me that, that I am honest about what it means to be me. What, the, what are my experiences are as, a, as an immigrant, as, as a black person, as a woman? And even though I am a private person, I push myself to talk more about myself because I know that that allows people to, 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 to have a new view into people like myself. And, and it's what we need to do for each other. It's what we need to, to do to tell each other our stories. Even, even the people like Clark and Cindy Edwards, and they are the wealthy um, um, characters in my novel. They are people that you might think you know them because they are rich, they are wealthy, they are the kind of people that we in New York City, the liberals, we, we love to hate because they are, 
they, they're not exactly the kind of people that we praise. But when you hear their story, right, you think about them differently, which is a great, the, the great thing about literature. It, it, once you know somebody's story, then it's, it's hard to judge them as much. You become more empathetic towards them. And the, the, the other side to, to, to that is also being a very good listener because uh, we are very prone to, to talk a lot <laughs> and to not want to listen. And I have learned as part of my writing, as part of being a, a, a writer and also of going around talking is that I should listen to other people more. I should listen to their stories. I should um, take the time to, to really understand where they're coming from. Because my novel came out in 2016, like I said earlier, and it was a very difficult moment for me because you know I had it was my first book and it came out and and there was just so much negativity in the air and and people wanted me to you know to take stands against against certain things. Oh, you know, you you talk about the people who voted for Trump. You don't like them, right? Um, and I and I realized that that is not the case. I I don't know why you voted for Trump that I am going to listen to you and, and understand your position, even though I wouldn't take that same position. So it, it, the, this book, the process of writing it and going out and talking about it changed me a lot because it, it gave me a lot of empathy to realize that everybody has a story. And I may not like your story, but the least I can do is to listen to your story and, and, to, and, to, um, and, and to take the time to understand your unique perspective. Well, in your introductory remarks, you, you said um, that some immigrants are feeling defeated, tired, or, or cynical. Um, so we want to ask you the next question uh, about, uh, about that. So we have many wonderful refugees from African countries, including Cameroon, mm -hmm. right here in, in Muscatine. What advice would you give a refugee who is pursuing their dreams in Iowa? And then what advice would you give to someone who wishes to welcome immigrants or refugees to Iowa? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you, Naomi. So I, um, I should start by saying that I, there are times when I thought about giving up on America and going back to Cameroon because I thought America was very difficult. So I, and I meet a lot of immigrants who say to me, oh, how did you survive? Why didn't you go back? And I, what really helped me was the people I met in America, the, the, the good people, because in spite of all the negativity towards immigrants um, in the past few years, I have found Americans to be very welcoming. I mean, I also arrived at a very different time. I arrived in 1998, which was you know, very different. And you know, Americans welcomed me to their houses. I, had, I was in college and I had friends who invited me to their houses for, for Thanksgiving, for Christmas. I had coworkers who bought clothes for me. I had, you know, acquaintances who, you know, helped me during times of difficulties. And so that, uh, that to me was a very, very big part of my journey here. So I think it's important to find um, a community of people, people who will support you, whether it's people from your country or from, from other American citizens, it's just people who um, will support you and will stand by you. And it's the same thing I'll say to the uh, people who want to help immigrants and refugees is it's just that welcoming. I was, I had a very hard time when I came here because I really missed home. Um, and I miss my mother, I miss the weather, but it made a huge difference whenever I met people who, who in big and small ways reminded me that, you know, I could still be at home here, that I could be welcomed to their, into their houses and, um, whether it was just by being kind, by smiling to me, by asking me about my hairstyle or something, those little things all make a big difference. But um, I, I think that that um, usually we might be uncomfortable talking to somebody who is different. But to me, the people who went out of their comfort zone to talk to me, to, to, to ask me questions, or even to you know, say, oh, let me just take you out to, for a cup of tea that made a huge difference towards me feeling comfortable and eventually staying here. Now, um, you, got, you brought this up earlier, you brought up the idea of empathy. So um, you know, I'd like to explore the idea of having empathy in times between us. Right now, you know, there's a lot of tension mm -hmm. in the midst of a pandemic and 
and we're still dealing with the outcome of our recent presidential election. Mm -hmm. so could you talk about why empathy is important at a time of right? Yeah, well, I I, I think that um, we we tend to have empathy towards people who are similar to us, right? So it's and I'll say that that is what happened to me in the process of writing this novel. I had a lot of empathy for the African immigrant characters. So if you had read earlier drafts of this novel, you would have seen that I was very kind to the African immigrants and I wasn't as kind to the rich white people because I thought, well, what do you need me to be kind to you for? You're, you're a rich white person and you have money and, and I'm not going to be that empathetic towards you. But it took a lot of me walking through that and searching myself and asking why I was being judgmental to realize that um, my inability to be empathetic to everybody was actually hurting me. It was, it was standing in the way of me seeing the world clearly. So when I, when I think about empathy in the time of chaos, I, I think of, again, it goes back to, 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 to listening to other people's stories. Because when you listen to somebody's stories, then you have a more likelihood of being empathetic towards them. I mean, there, there's just such little empathy towards the other side in America right now. And that is what breaks my heart to think that because somebody doesn't think like me, because they don't believe like me, because they didn't vote like me, I cannot be empathetic towards them. How dare they, they do that? That kind of thinking hurt me as a writer because it's, it didn't allow me to look deep within a character and recognize that we all after the same things, right? We are all after the same things. That is one of the things you realize when you write a novel is that human beings are incredibly similar. We all want to be happy. We all want to be healthy. We love our families. We love our friends where most of us maybe in different measures, but we all want the same things. We want to be safe. We want to be free. There's not much big difference between people. And it sounds like a cliche to say we all alike, but that is, it, we really are so alike. So once you start recognizing that, then you recognize that, oh my God, you know, this person is, is just like me. And, and, and what is happening, you know, especially in the past four years is that we lost a lot of that. We thought that because this person doesn't think like me, I cannot empathize with them. How dare you vote for Trump? How dare you vote for Hillary Clinton? Um, and, and, and I saw that, that that was an education for me because I realized that I have to step away from that. I cannot think like that. I have to look at every individual and ask myself, who are you? Why do you think like this? What happened to you? Where were you born? Why do you have, you know, yellow hair and why do you, you know, wear that kind of pants? I had to ask questions of everybody I meet and get to know them, not put them in any sort of group. For people who don't quite do that, for people who have trouble seeing other people as, as the same, how, how can we help convince them to, to have empathy, to see, to see each other's similarities? Well, I think, you know, and that's a good point. I think that it, 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 comes, it comes from just you doing, right? It's, it's like what all of the great um, men before us have said, that you be the change you want to see. Um, I, I mean, I give a lot of talks on empathy all the time, and I know that, you know, some people are not going to be convinced. So what can I do? I just have to be the person who is empathetic. <laughs> um, and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't come easy. I'm not sitting here to say that, oh, I am so empathetic. You know, I, I, I still struggle, but I am very hard on myself. I catch myself when I'm being judgmental. I catch myself when I'm being condescending. I catch myself when I say, oh, look at that person. I can't believe they think this. Because I know that that is not what is going to help us move forward as a country. Um, it is very... Um, I have stepped away from asking people to be something, even though I do it because I say that during my lecture, but I have realized that it is incumbent on me <laughs> to be empathetic. I, I, it is near impossible to make somebody else empathetic. I have to make myself be the empathetic one so that if I meet you, Daniel, and, and you say, oh, look at this annoying African, I'm going to say to, my, to myself, I wonder what is going on with Daniel today. I wonder why he's saying that. Because I cannot do anything about what you're saying. I can only be empathetic towards you no matter what you're saying. And it is not easy. I am not saying that it's easy. But that is what these past four years has taught me. Our next question in Bolo, in Bolo is about curiosity. And of course, Daniel and I 
represent uh, Muscatine Community College in, in different roles, and uh, and we work with uh, curiosity of our students all the time. So there is a sense of curiosity with the characters in your book, uh, the Jongas, about America and what life is like here. There's also curiosity with the Edwards uh, family that, that you mentioned before. What message are you trying to give the readers about curiosity and why is it important to be curious? Mm. Well, I, I can't say I was trying to give any message per se because I, I had only one goal in this story and it was just to tell the story and, and I leave the messages up to the reader. But I am a big believer in curiosity. Um, I, I became a writer in part because I was curious about people. Uh, when I came to America, I, I, I had never encountered many different, the kind of people I encountered in America. Before coming here, I had never met somebody who identified as gay. I had never met an Asian person. I had never met many kinds of people. And then I went to college and I said, oh my God, this is very different. Um, but I was curious about the people I met. I, I, I became very good friends with a gay man who is still one of my good friends, even though my initial, my initial instinct was to say, I don't understand you. I don't want to be around people like you because I don't understand you. But I pushed myself to get to know him because I was curious about what it means to be gay. I, I went to a Korean American church because I was, you know, I was curious about a very different culture, like a Korean culture. And at one point, I met a, a man who was from West Virginia. He was a hippie, and I, I was very curious. And I thought, oh, I'm going to marry this hippie guy and move to West Virginia and live as a hippie. It didn't quite work out, but but I was very curious about the life of a hippie. And so I um, and my friends made fun of me. They say, "Why do you keep on, you know, surrounding yourself with people who are so different?" But it's because I'm in America, and there's so many different kinds of people. Why not? Why not discover it? Why not? Why not learn about it? And and that curiosity self me in becoming a writer, because that 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 desire to know the other other people who are different from me, um, it helped me to think about the characters and go deep into their lives. Um, uh, and to create worlds, uh, but in, in your everyday life, it, it, is, it is a way of strengthening your empathy, because the more you're curious, the more you ask questions, the more you become empathetic. Well, uh, people started recognizing and seeing your book that you wrote after um, it was featured in Oprah Magazine, and Oprah, it was in her in her book club. And I believe she invited you also to her mansion and you got to spend time with her and so on. And uh, she, and you talked to her about Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon. Mm -hmm. And uh, Oprah, um, and I quote, she said, it's about race and class, the economy, culture, immigration, and the dangers of the us versus them mentality. And underneath it all comes the heart and soul of family love, the pursuit of happiness, and what home really means in this book. So, could you tell us about those experiences, the impact that they had on you, and the impact that books can have on people? Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. I, Oprah did pick my book for for uh, for her book club, not when it came out, but when it came out in paperback, not when it came out originally. And yes, I did go to her house, and and she she does sound like Oprah. She is she is exactly the way she is on TV. <laughs> um, so there wasn't much of a surprise there. She was lovely, um, but. I, I should say that I did come to writing somehow through the Oprah's book club because I had never thought about becoming a writer. I didn't grow up in a literary culture. Nobody where I came from grew up and said, oh, I want to be a writer when I grow up. It was just not a thing. And then I came to America and, and one day I went to a, to, a, to a public library. Hello to the librarians. I, I love public libraries. Um, and I, and I saw a book called Song of Solomon by Toni Morrison. At that point, I barely knew anything about Toni Morrison except for the fact that she had won the Nobel Prize in Literature a few years before. So I borrowed this book by Toni Morrison and I, and I read it. And the moment I finished reading it, I just started writing because I was so inspired. Um, but that, that is what books mean to me. Um, before reading this book, I'd always been a reader. I'd been reading for a very long time. But something about that book, and many, many writers of color, many black writers would tell you that that book meant a lot to them. And I would recommend it if you haven't read it. Um, 
there's something about it that that is so awe inspiring and so powerful that um, it triggers you know something if you have any kind of of thing within you stirring to come out something about reading that book does that um, and so that is how I started ri writing that I I didn't go to um, school to study writing I, I didn't take any writing classes I don't have an MFA my writing came you know solely from being a reader from reading lots and lots of writers um, from the great African writers of my childhood like Ngugi Wachiongo and Chinua Achebe to reading American writers like Tony Morrison, Juno Diaz, Jonathan Franzen, lots of contemporary American writers. That's how I came to writing. Um, and I, I, love, I love the written word. I, I, I am in awe of books. Even now that I am a writer, I still meet other writers that are Maya and I go like, oh my God, I can't believe I just met you because I am just in awe of anything that has to do with books and writers. But my, my writing comes from a place of passion. I, I am passionate about stories. I'm passionate about us understanding each other and me understanding my fellow humans and as a, and as a result growing from that, um, from, from, the, from, from understanding them. Well, we're going to uh, take some audience questions now also. And our first question has to do with the immigration process. What do you think America should do to improve the immigration process? Hmm. Yeah, that, that is a difficult one because there is a lot that could be done. Um, I, I think that it is very unfair. I mean, the, the first thing that comes to mind is, is the separation of families. Um, it is very heartbreaking to me as an immigrant to see how families are being um, separated. And I think that perhaps the first thing we could do would, would be to try to keep families together. I mean, immigration is very complex. I, I, I remember way back in, you know, years ago when, um, you know, the late Senator Kennedy and the late Senator John McCain were trying to change, you know, immigration laws and, and even, you know, sen and former Senator um, Clinton, um, they were trying to do a lot to change immigration laws and it's just very difficult because it's a very divisive issue. But at the root of it is, is, is what America is about, right? It's, what is America? And America to me is, is, a, is a country of immigrants. I mean, as cliche as that sounds, this is a country that um, gets a lot of its identity from people who came here in search of a better life, whether it was way back you know, with the pilgrims and what I, or to people, um, people like myself. So I think that what we could do is, is to make the process a lot um, more direct. I mean, the American immigration system is very complicated, extremely complicated, and also very expensive. <laughs> um, and, and, and I'm grateful for organizations like the one you mentioned, Naomi, um, the ones that help immigrants, because the characters in my novel, they didn't have that. Um, and for those who read the novel, you'll see that they, they, they suffered a lot by the fact that they didn't have the best representation. Um, and so if, 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 if the legislation could, could help people who, who, who otherwise don't have um, the resources or to, to pay for lengthy legal, uh, legal process and make the process a little bit simpler, that could go a long way. And just real quick before we move on, I'd just like to remind everyone watching that you can submit your questions online. All you have to do is find the chat box on your computer screen, enter your name, uh, check the agree box, then you can start sharing questions. And you only have to sign in once, you can submit as many questions as you'd like to. Well, <laughs> so our next question here comes from Claudia, and she's asking, was there any moment that you didn't feel welcome here? And if there was, could you give context? Hmm. Oh, yes. But the moments when I didn't feel welcome had a lot to do less to do with being an immigrant and more to do with my race as a black person um, because I, um, I, I, I did not really understand racism as an African growing up in a country where pretty much everybody was black. I didn't understand that I would be treated differently by some people because I am black. And so um, the, the, the situations where people reminded me that I was black and that as a black person, maybe I'm not so welcome in certain places or, or maybe um, 
I, I am not deserving of certain rights or privileges. That is when I felt most, most not welcome. I, it, not so much because I was an immigrant, but because I was a black person. And that, that, was, that was a bitter pill to swallow um, because I, um, I, I was very naive in thinking that you know, once I come to America and America is this wonderful country, nobody's going to care <laughs> that I was black. And then I had to um, learn, learn the hard way. We have a question about food in Bongo, mm -hmm. and we already talked about chicken nuggets. Um, <laughs> and I also understand uh, that you enjoy cheesecake. Oh, yes. And, and, and I do too. Uh, so that's another thing that we share. In fact, my mother makes the best cheesecake in the world. Uh. And uh, so the question is, uh, I enjoyed the description of food in your novel. Mm. What foods did you miss most when you came to America? Oh yeah, oh yes, I I grew up around such good food. I miss I miss the food a lot. Um, what do I miss most? Well, I grew up um, in a town on the oceans, like I mentioned in my talk. Limbe is right on the Atlantic Ocean, and and we had um, when I was growing up, the the fishermen went fishing and they they came and they sold the fish right on right on the shores. So you know most days you just go to the show and you just buy your fish right there and then you come home and cook it and i do miss that i do miss the fact that you know you don't have to go to the supermarket to buy fish you just buy your fish right there from the fishermen and come back home and you grill it and you have freshly grilled fish and um, that even even though I, I live in new york city um for a while that was something that i couldn't just get there because i um it's, it's one of those pleasures that you need to you get only when you actually live like on the seaside town where you can buy the fish right there we did a project uh, with some of our English language learners at the college, and they had a performance uh, with Iowa's former poet laureate, Mary Swander. Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel was, was uh, one of the students uh, who assisted us, and many of the uh, African students talked about a dish called fufu. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Yes, yes, yes. We, yeah, I imagine the West Africans, because that is a common staple. Fufu is very common. We eat that also. I do miss fufu because it's, it's, it's a very common staple. <laughs> okay, and just real quickly on the topic of food, I just find it very interesting. In the novel and in, in just your culture as well, um, when they were about to eat with, with people there, it wasn't just sit at this table, it was sit where you like, eat food. Yeah. Right. Oh, no, it's just a lot more free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I still eat with my hands, you know. I Even when I have my American friends come over, I eat with my hands and they go, why are you doing that? You can use a utensil. I'm like, I know, but I like to use my hands to eat. <laughs> and fufu, by the way, you eat it with your hands. You, so you, you, you cut a bit of it and you put it, you dunk it in the soup. <laughs> now we know. Yeah. <laughs> so um, our next question is here. So, Obviously, you know, when you left, you had family, you had friends. When you were here, um, how did you communicate with your loved ones back home? Did you call, FaceTime, letters? Uh, mm. how did it work for you? Yeah, so back in the 90s, when I came in the late 90s, people did not have cell phones. So, and, and we, we also did not have um, a phone. I mean, my, 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 mother, my mother is a single woman and she didn't have the kind of money to have a phone at home. So the letters were the only way. So you, you wrote a letter and it took, I don't know, three months, three weeks or to one month to get back home. And then they reply you, it takes another three weeks to, to get back to you. Um, and that is how we communicated with letters. And at one point I had a big stash of like all these letters my family and friends sent me over the years. But thankfully technology got um, pretty developed and everybody started having cell phones. So now I, if I have any news to share, I don't have to wait for it for, for one month for them to hear it because I'm just, I can just call right now. Our next uh, question is uh, about what uh, selection process do you use to decide what issues to include in your novel and what issues to skip? And mm. the example that's given is uh, Nenny, a character in your novel, delivers a baby girl. And it was an opportunity for you to include a discussion about health care mm -hmm. in your story. So why, what made you select health care as an issue 
to explore in your book and uh, not some other important issues? Yeah, so I, I don't write about issues, I write about people. Um, so my, my writing is character driven, which means that if I'm telling a story about, you know, about Daniel, I'm not going to write about, you know, I'm going to write the issue of Daniel being a young man, I'm going to write about Daniel as a person, what he likes, the, what he goes through, and, and through that you can see the issues he deals with. So um, I, I am very interested in, in people. Uh, and through people, you can you can see um, you know whatever issues they're dealing with. So I was I didn't set out to write a novel about the American dream. I didn't set out to write a novel about immigration. My characters happen to be immigrants. My characters happen to be pursuing the, pursuing the American dream, because I for me I don't believe in having an agenda as a writer. My only agenda should be to tell the story honestly and completely. And whatever issues. Um, the character is dealing with is going to come out organically in the story. So if, if I address healthcare, I didn't address healthcare, that was just a consequence of me telling the story completely and honestly, not because I wanted to use my novel to make a point because I, I am not interested in that. Um, anybody can interpret the story any way they want. My, I, I have no, no interest in, in being twitchy or moralizing and saying, this is how you should see. look at how immigrants' lives are difficult or immigration is good, immigration is bad. That is not what I'm after. I, I believe that if I tell the story honestly and completely, you are going to see everything clearly for yourself. Well, well may, I, may I ask you a, a follow-up question without giving away the ending of the book, because I understand some of our audience uh, may be just in the middle of it right now. Um, did you have the ending of the book in your mind as you began writing? I did not. I, I, I did not have the ending. I had, I had the characters. I, I, I knew I wanted to tell a story about these two families. But no, I started writing and then I got to the ending and I said, OK, this is how it ends. Um, but, but I would say that because people want to talk about the ending all the time. Everywhere I go, people say, why does it end like this? Tell me why. And, and I understand that, you know, <laughs> everybody has, has their own idea of how it should have ended. But I, I just was telling the story that um, was very real to me and I wanted the story and the ending to be completely realistic. And even back when I was trying to get the novel published, I remember, uh, I remember an agent saying to me that you need to change this ending uh, because it's not, without saying too much, it's not a classic happy ending, right? If you could interpret it any way. Uh, but the agent said, um, Americans love happy endings, and this is not a very clear happy ending, so you need to change it. And I said, I am not going to change it, and Americans are going to have to take it as it is, because this is, this is honestly how the story ends. We're all optimists here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, after finishing your wonderful book, a lot of people are wondering what they should read next. So what, what are you reading, and, and do you have anything new that that might be coming up for people to read. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part of your question. Oh, uh, so yeah, people are wondering what they should read next. So what are you currently reading? Or is okay. there something new that you're going to have coming out for, for people to read? Uh, well, I, I have, so what am I reading now? I, as I'm reading, the, I'm reading, I'm about to start reading a book which um, had a wonderful review. It's, um, it's called The Dead Arising. It is, um, it is a definitive biography of Malcolm X, which um, I love biography and history. So I am about to start reading that. Um, and I, um, I'm also reading a book by a Swedish writer because I love to read um, novels out from other countries. Um, and this is a novel by a, a, a Swedish writer who I've never read, heard about. Um, as far as um, my own writing, I have another book coming out in March. Um, March 9, it is called How Beautiful We Were. And it is, um, it is a story of what happens when a small African village decides to fight against an American oil company that is polluting their land. Would you describe your childhood in Africa to us in Bolo and what lessons uh, that you have gained from that? Um, yeah, so I, I, I would say I had a, a, a mostly happy childhood. I, I, um, I spent 
my early years, from, from birth to about seven or eight years old, I lived in a couple of different villages with my mother. My mother um, was a civil servant. She worked for the government as a community development expert, which means that she taught women how to, um, how to improve their lives by you know, farming and, and taking care of the children, whatever it is that they needed to learn to live better lives. So I lived in different villages and then I later on moved to live with my aunt in, in a town. And that was when I discovered books. Um, so when I discovered books, about eight years old, I was a very bookish kid. Um, I, I pretty much looked for books wherever I could find. Um, my town did not have a public library. We didn't have bookstores. Uh, I just, you know, if I went to somebody's house and I saw a book, I just took it or maybe I borrowed it. But I, if I was walking down the street and I saw an old newspaper, I just picked it up. Um, I, um, and I think that, you know, that, that growing up without, uh, without having a lot of books around me, especially in my hometown of Limbe, that really created a test in me for, for books. And when I came to America and I discovered there was such a thing as public libraries, I was besides myself with joy, which is why I have to give a shout out to public librarians because public libraries, um, just one of my favorite places in the world. Whenever I move to a new town, the first thing I do is get a library card because I, I need to be able to get my books. Um, but my, I had a happy childhood. I, 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 I think that I also had a religious childhood. So I was raised by, um, by religious women. <laughs> which means that um, it, it came out in many different ways, but one of the things that, that um, my religious childhood emphasized in me was, was character and discipline and hard work. And those things ended up paying, paying, uh, you know, paying really dividends for me in America because the, the, um, the discipline and hard work I learned in Cameroon really helped me um, in America through a lot of difficulties and definitely as, as a writer. Go back to a question about your book, Imolo. At one point, Jende and Nenny wonder how people who are as wealthy as the Edwards could have so much happiness and unhappiness skillfully wrapped up together. Mm -hmm. What is your answer to that? <laughs> well, I, I believe it's called being human, right? Um, we, we, can, we can all present many different sides of ourselves, the happy sides, unhappy sides, the sides that are happiness and unhappiness wrapped up together. Um, but yeah, it is, it, it is one of those things that I, I learned from being curious about other people uh, to, in, seeing, um, in seeing how somebody can, can be so happy. And I think that that line was referring to Cindy Edwards, who on the surface has everything and yet as you find that later in the book, she also comes with a lot of baggage, which um, is, is causing a deep unhappiness within her. And so my, um, that, that came from my observation of people and seeing how, how humans in general, how we all long to be happy and how we so often push through our unhappiness to be happy and how hard we fight. And, and, and I put a lot of that into Cindy Edwards, who by the way was a very difficult character. That was probably the, the, the most difficult character for me to write. You talked a little bit earlier about dreams and how sometimes they might not come true and, and you might have to adapt. Can you talk just a little bit about like your process of, of the dreams that you were trying to accomplish and didn't, because I believe you, you started out in communications and then somehow ended up trying to publish your book and it didn't happen right away, you know, did it? No, no. So, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I went to college at Vodgas University in New Jersey and I studied business management. Uh, and my, um, I, I wanted to be an accountant. So that was probably my first dream. And then I took a couple of accounting classes and I completely flunked them. And that was the end of that dream because I realized that I am not very good with numbers. So then I shifted my dream to, to working in finance because I, 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 I think what was important to me very much was financial security in, in a foreign country. As an immigrant, I, I, I wanted to be able to pay my bills and not have to worry about money it's because I, I didn't have parents in this country to take care of me. So I tried to move to finance and after college, I tried to get a job on Wall Street <laughs> and that didn't work out for me either. So I decided to go to law school 
and I took the LSAT and um, got into law school, but I couldn't exactly get the loans to go to law school because I needed somebody to, to help me get the loans and that didn't um, come together. So that was the end of my law school dreams. So after that, I got a corporate job and then I thought, okay, I'm going to become a college professor. So I, I, I took the, the, um, the GRE and I applied to go to get to PhD program and I got into a wonderful PhD program with full scholarship. But this was in, um, in 2009, in the midst of the financial crisis. And I felt uncomfortable quitting my corporate job and going to get a PhD during the financial crisis. So I turned down that PhD offer and I stayed at my corporate job. Then I ended up losing my corporate job. So now I had no PhD and I had no, <laughs> no corporate job. And it was in the midst of trying to get a new job that I had the inspiration to write Behold the Dreamers. And, and then I am, um, after, after writing the novel for a couple of years, I tried to get an agent because to write a novel, to, to publish a novel, first you need to get an agent and then the agent takes it to the publisher. So I, I wrote the novel and I sent it to agents around the country and pretty much everybody rejected the novel. Um, and it took me a lot, of, it took me three years to get an agent. And eventually my agent um, um, found a publisher for the novel. So I, I like to joke that, you know, I, I, I am an expert on failures. And because before, before, coming, before getting to this point, it was one failure after another. And, and I think that in a way, Behold the Dreamers is about failures also. Uh, it is about failures of a, of a bank, Lehman Brothers, which is at the center of the story, it was about the failure of that. It's about the failure of, of, of characters to, to, um, to achieve their dreams. And it's about the failure of immigration system to, to, to fully welcome immigrants like the Jungas into the country. Kind of awesome. I'm going to um, the next question here from the audience. Uh, it says, had you started with this book idea before the events of, of 2008 and 2009, would you have changed it or, or would you, or was this kind of your idea all along of, of having this be a book? Um, I don't, I mean, I, I don't suppose it would be much different. I mean, I wrote this novel from 2011 to 2016 and and when I started in 2011, the world wasn't, um, I mean, America, America was a very different place as far as immigration. Immigration wasn't very much in the news. Um, but I, like I said earlier, I don't exactly write about issues. I write about people and about their lives and their struggles and their dreams and hopes. So I don't suppose that would have changed a lot because you know, gender was still what gender was. Maybe their struggle as far as immigration would have been different because it probably would have been much harder um, trying to move through the process in 2016 compared to 2008 or 2009. But I, uh, I, I don't think that the story would have been much different. Uh, we'll ask you another question about the relationship between gender and many uh, and they, a walk between uh, their tradition and their family histories, and then uh, wh how, what they're seeing and learning in modern uh, American life. So uh, at one point, uh, Jendi takes the lead in making decisions for their family, mm -hmm. and Nenny uh, decides to submit to, to, be, to his decisions. Is that the way the culture still is today in Cameroon? Um, yeah, but it's not, it's not just specific to Cameroon. I mean, I, I see that in many different cultures. I mean, it also happens in America um, that there are wives who are very submissive to their husbands, even though it's, I guess it's a little, it's less likely in America. But, but yes, many, they have a very traditional marriage. Um, and that is part of what causes a conflict later in the novel because Nanny becomes uh, somewhat very Americanized, so to speak. She, she, she starts trying to assert herself more in the marriage and, and gender, you know, in a way wants his wife to stay traditional and to listen to him. And um, so I, I, I think that, I, I think that, um, that, that, is, um, that is a huge part of being a woman. It is, it is not just, you know, an African woman, but a woman who has dreams and who, in a way, sort of outgrows her marriage because Nene, by virtue of getting educated and, and adopting American ideals, 
she starts you know shifting and separating herself from gender and 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 that is again part of the tension in the novel on here some people suggest that your novel uh, seems to say that class is the predominant struggle in Sedona's life not the race Agree with that? um I, I i i would say that class has been a very big struggle in my life um maybe not so more than race but it has been more predominant in my life, my whole life, you know, because growing up in Cameroon, I grew up in a very class conscious society. And, and, I, and I had, I saw the struggles that people had by virtue of their class, even though we were all black, I saw how much class plays a role in people's lives. And then I came to America and I saw the same thing, especially because in America, unlike in Cameroon, in America, I was actually poor, right? I was there were times when I, I, I barely had enough money to, to buy a meal. So I saw what it, it's like to be working class in America. And during my struggles in America as, as, a, as, a, as a working class person, I didn't exactly think, oh, this is because I am black. Yes, it might, I'm sure, you know, my being black was tied to it. But because I had, I had also um, witnessed what it's like to be, to be of, the, of a lower class in Cameroon, and I was a lower class in America, I am very much more aware to class. So if somebody were to discriminate against me because I'm wearing, you know, old, ugly clothes, it, I'm more likely to think that it has to do with my class and with my race because class is just more ingrained in me. That is not to say that it is the case for everybody. It's just that from my personal experience, I am I'm just very, very aware of class. Then what other are our last question uh, for you tonight, and we'd like to um, ask if there is an upcoming book that you are working on, and when might we expect that? Uh, will there be a sequel to Behold? <laughs> uh, there, yes, I get the sequel question quite a bit. I, um, I, I, I have no plans for a sequel. Um, if I'm going to write one, it's going to be many, many years from today because I, I don't. Have, I, I, I never imagined a sequel because when I finished writing this story, I thought, okay, that's it. This is how it ends. And then people said, no, that's not how it ends. It's a lot more. Tell us more. Tell us what happened after. And I am very, very honored that people want to hear more of this story. But I, I would like to tell other stories. And I just mentioned earlier, my, my next novel, which is coming out in March, it is, it is different in many ways from Behold the Dreamers. It has to do with... Um, with a community fighting against uh, an oil company. And so that, that is different, but it, it still has similar ele elements. Behold the Dreamers is very much about power also. It has to do with the power between, power dynamics between the two families. And, and my next novel, which is about, you know, this big oil versus this small company has a lot to do with power also. Um, and so that, that, that's the next novel I'm going, I have coming out. Um, um, but I, I, I think maybe, you never know, I might go back to Behold the Dreamers one day, but for now I have other stories I'd like to tell. Well, on behalf of Daniel and me, thank you so very much for the time you spent with us. It was truly an honor. Uh, it was very, very informative and motivational. And uh, we have so many things that, that we share together. So thank you. Thank you so very much, Bolo. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Daniel. It was a pleasure. And next is uh, Sharla Schaefer from the Community Foundation of Greater Muscatine. Thank you, Mbolo, for both the enriching evening of conversation and reflection. I thought it was interesting earlier where you said you were a private person, but you're, yet you were able to share your story. And I think your public words, um, you know, the impact that's had on the conversations around immigration and the conversations we've had tonight and the learning, you know, your words actually allow us to enter the inner rim of communities and lives that many of us would never have the opportunity to comprehend without that. And, and I think we've all been left both illuminated in perspective as well as deepened in empathy and so we're grateful for your time. We're grateful for the fact that a private person decided to share the, her, her stories and her words in a way that allow us to have that perspective. 
And I think the conversation tonight has been incredibly powerful and, and we're gonna visit a little bit more about that. But I wanna introduce my good friend and colleague, uh, Vivian Jardine. Vivian, besides having a strong intellect and, and a loving heart, also brings an informed perspective around the immigra immigration perspective. Um, her experiences, she actually uh, has moved to the United States from Brazil. She and her husband, Luciano, now have two grown sons, but they left Brazil in 1996. Since she's arrived here, she's offered, authored a couple of books around her experience. One is around the, the language and the, the learning difficulties around the language. And the second was in regard to uh, the relocation uh, from an international perspective and relocating. And I, and I uh, ask her to share a little bit tonight. I'm gonna to turn it over to her in just a quick second, but I want her to talk a little bit about her firsthand, how her firsthand experiences actually trans, uh, transcend some of the experiences that we saw within the book. So Vivian, could you please share? Absolutely, uh, thanks for having me. Um, and Bolo, for me, it was so much fun to read your book because I saw myself you know, in, on those pages. And as you shared you know, some of your experiences, it is, you know, um, very aligned with with um, what I experienced as an immigrant. So, um, a couple of things that I you know want to share is just learning the language and the culture, right? So that obstacle and that challenge. And the way I wanted to learn English was kind of a matrix style. You know, you just download English into my brain, and then I, I'm able to communicate. But um, I was so in a hurry and so eager to be able to carry on a conversation and get my ideas across, only to learn, you know, a few years later that it's a lifelong journey. And, uh, you know, for me, speaking English with no accent, it's almost an unreachable, you know, goal. So I had to make peace with that. And then also learning the culture, right? So I see that so much in your book and I laughed out loud so many times. It's just learning, you know, what is, what is appropriate, you know, for, for an immigrant and, um, you know, just in the day-to-day -day situations that you find yourself in. So talking about food, right? So in America, you eat pizza with your hands which you will never ever do in Brazil. You know, you would use your utensils and try to try to explain these to my two boys, you know, when they go visit Brazil, it's like, we're going to a pizza place, you're not eating with your hands. <laughs> so, you know, just uh, learning what's appropriate in the culture you're in and learning that it's a lifelong journey as well. So things that come naturally to you as, you know, as you go to a job interview or a visitation or a wedding or a birthday party, all of that had to be relearned. And, uh, and again, and I had to make peace with that, that that was a lifelong journey, you know, as well. And then what is expected of me, you know, in this community that I find myself in? And as I thought about community, you know, I kept, I found myself thinking, if only Nene and Jende would come to the Midwest. So I found myself thinking about that a lot because just like them, when we first moved to America, we, we lived in the Chicago suburbs and my husband worked downtown Chicago. So everything that you, you know, talk about in, in the book about the long work days, the long commutes. We experienced all that, you know, living in Chicago. And we didn't have much time together as a family. So when we had the opportunity to move to Muscatine, Iowa, you know, this little bitty town in the Midwest with lots and lots of industry in it, it made the world of difference for us, for our family. So um, first, we could now um, enjoy a more affordable cost of living. So we, that meant less anxiety about money and not, you know, not as much stress about being able to pay your bills. That meant we um, also no longer had, you know, the, the long work days and the long commute because in Muscatine, when I moved to here, you could get across town in five minutes. And now, 
the city has grown and it'll take like 15 minutes maybe. <laughs> so we do enjoy that, uh, you know, quality of life where you don't have the long commutes to and from work. And that meant that um, that wasn't getting stolen from, from our time as a family, which, you know, to me, time is our most precious resource because you cannot replace it. Um, then the other thing that would happen to us as we moved to a smaller community in the Midwest was we were able to build relationships and, and just get to know our neighbors and be known by our neighbors. We were able to get involved in our, you know, kids' school and church and just build relationships that then became our support system. Because in, as an immigrant, what a lot of people don't realize is that you don't have that. You don't have a support system that you can, you know, just drop off your kids, you know, at grandma's and go have a date night or, you know, things like that. So um, I found myself thinking, you know, if only um, Nanny and Jende had come to, to the Midwest. And then in the small community, we learned so much, so many things. So we learned to volunteer, which is not part of the Brazilian culture at all. So we learned that it was expected of us to make a contribution, which was great. We were happy to do it. We learned that when people talk to you, the premise is that they were telling the truth, <laughs> which also was the other way around in the culture, in many cultures and in the culture that I, I grew up in. And then we, we finally learned that it was not every man for, you know, for himself. And what, what a great thing to have a sense, you know, of community. And that was, you know, that was amazing to us. Another thing that I agree with you 100% is I love libraries. So we've learned so much and we decided to also invest in our education here in the U.S., so my husband got his MBA and I follow in his footsteps, you know, from University of Iowa. And uh, I learned um, quite a big, you know, quite many things from reading autobiographies. I love rags to riches stories of immigrants that came to America and uh, were able to attain the American dream. And um, as a result for us as a, as a family, we, you know, with more time, more resources, more education, we were able to give back to this community that welcomed us. And uh, we've been here for 20 years, you know, every time that we have an opportunity to move away, we count the cost and, and we come to the conclusion that for us as a family, um, it doesn't make sense. So, um, to me, it was interesting to, to, to see that for my immigrant family, we were able to attain our American dream in Muscatine, Iowa. However, you know, for Vince Edwards in the book, right, he went to India to attain his American dream. And I'd like to explain how I understand the American dream, because to me, it's, you know, it's the ability to, to attain your own personal version of success. And that looks different to different people. But where do you find, where is that place where you're going to find all the right ingredients, you know, that will help you um, attain that, you know, that goal, that success. So anyway, I just had a great time, you know, reading Behold the Dreamers, and I saw myself on the, those pages, and um, I laughed out loud, so thank you so much for writing the book. And in summary, what I want to leave, you know, the community with is, um, if there's one thing that I want you to remember as you meet, you know, immigrants in your path, there's one thing that I wanted to, you to remember is that an immigrant is someone who is willing to overcome great obstacles to reach that, you know, um, that success, that own personal version of success in of the American dream. So as you have time, you know, take time to to, to learn about them, about their journey, take time to encourage them. 
and most likely you're you're very likely to be inspired by their courage as well so thanks for having me i'll pass on to charla so you can see i'm blessed to have the opportunity <laughs> to get a chance to be friends and work with uh, the jardines and we as a community are blessed to have them in our community so thanks so much for sharing a little bit tonight yeah, Vivian. Absolutely. How can we continue to learn and move forward in this conversation? Well, this is the first in a series of author events that are going to be happening. And uh, we think uh, we think that Ebolo has uh, put us on a strong path tonight on, on where we're headed with this. So thank you again so much for that. Be on the lookout. At, right after the first of the year, um, we'll be looking at having a spring event. For those of you who are part of the book uh, book club, to make sure that you engage again. You know, we, we were chatting a little bit and reading and wine and friends. And, you know, we have got the book club trifecta and we'll have another, we'll be bringing another book alongside of that so, so you can learn as you move forward. Um, in partnership with the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Group, which is a volunteer group within our community, the Community Foundation has partnered with them and we've we've sponsored a youth-led initiative to develop a website. And the website's called uh, CelebrateMuscatine.org, and it was just launched this week, and it's it's a really it's going to be a great opportunity for our community. It's going to celebrate our neighbors and our legacy as well as our community in in several ways. We're going to be bringing personal stories of local leaders and the difference they're making. Uh, we're going to in the in the website pages will they'll be celebrating folks from our past locally that have really shaped. Our, the, the lives we live today and how, and how Muscatine and our local communities look. And then it's also gonna be providing a lot of educational resources. So educational resources for all ages too. So you're gonna to wanna to look at that, but around racial, economic, and, and, um, and as well as equitable learning opportunities. Now, I want to tell you as you get into the pages tonight, they're, they're continuing to add information. But as I indicated, this literally, this website was completely youth-led. It was a talented group of youth. We've got college students and, and one person that just write it just says uh, write from a graduate time frame. And it's pretty cool to see what happens when we keep the older adults out of the way of our youth and, and the good work that they do. So I want to thank Megan Custis for her leadership on that project, Natalie Jones, Destiny Williams. Your interviewer tonight, Daniel Salazar, is a contributor as well, and Mercedes Cardoza. So again, um, if you get a chance to take a look at that at celebratemuscatine.org. Please check back for stories and resources so you can learn more about your neighbors and our collective strengths. I think it's gonna be a ex exciting portal to have as part of our work and conversation. You know, you can also learn more about the racial justice fund that's been established and that's been established to further um, and advance equity and inclusion across both Muscatine and Louisa counties. There's granting funds that are gonna be available for organizations that are working to be accelerators or reduce barriers around racial justice um, and that's going to be centered toward uh, affecting the folks that are most marginalized. You know, it's been interesting what the preferences around that. It's there's going to be preference for those that are doing collaborative and network work, um, connecting multiple issues in communities, as well as organizations that are led by people of color. So I would encourage you to, if you have an interest to learn more, please do so. Um, if you'd like to donate to be part of the solution, we'd love to have that as well to give more dollars to this important work. Or if you would like to apply, we encourage you to do so as well if your organization's doing that type of work. Um, we mentioned a minute ago, the diversity, equity, and inclusion committee that we have, uh, the volunteer committee that's been developed. They've also recently developed a Facebook page and it's going to be there to highlight real time opportunities for news, um, updates, things going on within the community. And we, uh, it's called the diversity, equity and inclusion Muscatine Facebook page. And before you log off tonight, if you could please log in your Facebook page and go ahead and like the page. I think the information that's going to be coming your way will help you stay up to date with some of the conversations we're having and some of the, and some of the good work that's coming our way. Uh, we certainly want to take a moment and thank the leadership for the Stanley Center for Peace and Security for supporting bringing Mbolo to our community tonight, um, as well as the other sponsors. You know, Mustang Community College is one of the sponsors. And, I think it, we don't say it enough, but they're a tremendous asset for our community. I, if you look at the root of success of so many of the people within Muscatine and sprinkled across the globe, the beginnings of that often were at MCC, getting additional education, getting additional opportunities and networking. So we're thankful for the part they played in the sponsorship tonight. 
obviously um, we're privileged to be part of the community foundation and, and we thank our leadership for allowing us to be part of the sponsor of the event. And then we need to mention the, the incredible Musser Public Library. And we've talked about libraries a little bit tonight and how important they are, but if you haven't had a chance to visit ours in Muscatine, please take time. Uh, it's an amazing resource, but it's an amazing place. We need to thank Krista Regine for kicking us off this evening and, and certainly appreciate that. Dr. Nami DeWinter and Daniel Salazar for doing a tremendous job. You know, they, they kind of peppered, <laughs> peppered questions and, and we learned so much in such a short amount of time and the questions were feeling so, feeling so well, but thank you to all of them. We certainly thank the talented team of both communications and operations from the Stanley Center. They've been working diligently behind the scenes to make both the, the what you see as well as who you see look amazing. Um, I, I've been told that they have me looking like Jennifer Aniston tonight, so I'm, I'm really appreciative of that work. I can't wait to get home and watch the video. But there is truly an incredible amount of work that goes on behind the scenes when the, these types of uh, events are put together, and it's been very well done. So kudos to them. I thank my amiga Vivian sitting next to me tonight for sharing a glimpse of her experiences and letting us see the connections that we see between the immigrant experience. We're going to be sending out a survey next week and we really would like to get some of your feedback and, and ask that you respond so that we can make the future events as meaningful as possible. So please take time to do that when you receive the information. Um, and Bolo, we certainly thank you for visiting Iowa tonight. We wish that we could have had you visit in person. I think you certainly would have enjoyed our communities. But we, we think um, how you have allowed the dialogue to come alive through your characters and words and your voice will carry on and make us a better community, a strengthened community from that. And so thank you so much. To all of you that have taken time on your Friday night to engage and participate and grow, um, I think we've expanded our collective empathy and understanding, and it's so important when we reflect on our neighbors and children. And we heard it over and over, we heard it from Vivian, and, and we've heard it several times tonight, but we have, to, we have to listen and learn and be inquisitive. And I think when we do all that, that we'll, we'll all be, be better. But I think if we can just become a personal brand of love and inclusion and continue to try to get just a little bit better of that each day, uh, the outcomes are gonna be stronger for us personally, but certainly stronger for us collectively. I thank all of you again for your time and, and the engagement this evening, and I, and I wish you well. Have a great evening. Good night. Thanks for having us.